Well, hey, boys and girls, welcome to another exciting episode of Issues, the political talk show that's sure to make you run home to mommy and tell her that they hurt your feelings. And she might just say, oh, that's a good little, little boy or little girl. But anyway, guess what? It's 4th of July. And that's right, I hope you celebrated your Independence Day because while you slept last night, more of your rights were taken away. That's right, one by one, folks, your rights are being taken away. But you know what? Let's just get right to it. What rights did you have in the first place, huh? Did you ever, ever really have any rights? I, I, I don't know, man. From what I'm being told is in the 13th Amendment, all your rights were taken out of the Constitution. So 1 through 12 were erased when 13 came along. See if you can find it. Go out to your history books and see if you can find the 13th Amendment where we gave everything back to England, folks. We did it. That's right. And poor Constitution. Well, hey, man, I was listening to my favorite Overnight America with John Grayson, and he had an interview with this guy from this book called Conspiracy Theories for Dummies. Now, of course, this rhymes near and dear to me, not because I like conspiracy theories so much, but I'm a dummy. But when you put the two together, I couldn't resist. And so I was listening to this guy talk, and this is done by a Freemason, folks. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Freemasons, but they wrote the word conspiracy. They're the ones that started the whole thing. And as time went on, things got really, really crazy. So the first thing this guy writes about is, don't believe the conspiracies. It's just a bunch of hua. Well, let's talk about some of the conspiracies now. You know, there's the Skull and Crossbones organization. Now, according to the book, hey, this is just a really cool frat, you guys. I mean, it's a great way to meet really cool people and to expand your career in the future, especially if you want to be in politics. I mean, why would you even go to Yale if you didn't want to be part of the Skull and Bones organization? I mean, don't mind the little child sacrifices stuff at the Bohemian Club. You know, none of that really matters. It, it's all good. There's no conspiracy with those guys. The next one up the ladder, of course, is the Trilateral Commission. Now, a lot of you conspiracy people think that these guys are one of the major groups calling all the shots. But no, man, these, they're just a bunch of people that are like looking out for you. You know, they're like leaders that, you know, they want to make sure that you're safe at night and, and you got a blanket and your pillow's clean and you don't have bed bugs. I mean, they're creating a better world for you, aren't they? I mean, that's what this is all about with the Trilateral Commission. They're, they're not trying to hide anything from you or, or try to rule your world or take away your rights or any of that stuff. No, no, you know, don't mind those guys. They're, they're cool. And now at the top of the list for you conspiracy people, it's the Bilderberg Group. And if you recall back about November of last year, I brought up the Bilderberg Group. Well, these are the guys that are really calling the shots. But no, that's only if you believe in conspiracies, folks, because you know what? Say your car was broken. Would you want to go and talk to a dentist about getting your car fixed? No, of course not. So if your country's in trouble and you're having a bunch of issues, do you want to talk to your dentist about that too? No, of course, you need some experts. And that's what the Bilderberg groups are. You know, so you guys just shut up. Let the Bilderbergs tell you what you're going to do. And, uh, you know, hey, this guy can be your, your imperial leader. You know, it's, he doesn't look so bad, does he? Just shut up and let them lead you, okay? Just be a bunch of sheep. Well, the next news was John Kerry, folks. John Kerry made the news because he was on some sort of overseas expedition, and he brought up this thing about spying and well, you know, this is just like so funny, you know, because, oh, spying, we spy, you spy, you know, we all spy, a spy versus spy. Well, I mean, that's really fucking stupid, John. And I mean, you're just like, just right taking after Hillary. I mean, you guys are a pair. I mean, there's Carrie, there was Clinton, and she said a bunch of stupid shit, and then Carrie's saying a bunch of stupid shit. But you know what's really stupid about all this, folks, is that, 50 years ago, there was a movie in the 1960s that starred Jackie Gleason. It was called Don't Drink the Water. And this is a great movie about how some American tourists ended up on a plane that got hijacked and he landed in Bulgaria. And Jackie Gleason was taking films with his family and the Bulgarian officials saw that and they decided that, uh, 
Oh, he must be a spy. So, you know, they, they take him back to the United States Embassy, and there's this guy, Ted Bessel. He was on That Girl, by the way. Ted Bessel is our illustrious uh, liaison in our commissary or uh, embassy there. And, and let me show you this clip, folks. I'm going to show you this clip about what Ted Bessel says about spying. Jack. Here. Here. Come on, here. You can judge for yourself. Believe me, they are not spies. They are American tourists. Did you see the shirt that guy was wearing? They're spies. Go ahead. Develop the film. It's nothing but noses. Anyhow, they have committed a criminal act. Come on, now. Why all the fuss? You spy on us, we spy on you. Everybody knows it. Why do we have to pretend it's so unusual? Oh. You admit you're a spy. Well, it's just like John Kerry, and you know, they even look alike. I mean, look at these two, Ted Bessel, John Kerry, oh man. And you know what happened in that movie? Well, poor old Jackie Gleason, he had to change his identity and move out of the country because they just fucked it up, man. They just really fucked it up. Oh well, so why does the world hate us? You know, it's like, well, there's all kinds of, what? Wait a minute. What? Oh my God, there's been a plane crash, folks. Oh my God, there's a plane crash, and we're just getting word right now. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube activity, and, and there's a lot of, lot of other activity. I think we'll go via satellite right now. That's right, let's link up to our satellite. Okay. And here we go to New York City. WHAT in New York City, take it away. My, my God, I'm just being told right now the plane has actually crashed in a huge spiraling fireball of death on the Empire State Building. It's pandemonium. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm losing it. I'm losing it, people. Wow, that's really amazing. Uh, hell, we, we, we better go to the CIA right now and see what's going on with them. Um, yes, I can confirm plane has gone down in San Francisco possibly an explosion in the cargo compartment. We plan to seize all phone records in the San Francisco Bay Area and all internet communications. We'll get to the bottom of this. Good grief. Oh, I think we got a report from Nebraska. K-O-R-N, K-O-R-N in Nebraska. A plane crash? Good God. Wow, that was really important. I hope you got that. Now, let's, let's go to W-E-H-I in Oakland. Welcome to W-E-H-I. I'm reporting from the closest place we could get to the crash. And yes, we did hear a sound. We heard a sound. That is confirmed. And I'm back to you, Spelly. Oh, it's just getting more and more delirious, folks. I don't know what to think. Back to New York City right now. Back to New York City. I'm actually being told now from my affiliate in San Francisco, it has hit the Golden Gate Bridge. That is right, it has hit the Golden Gate Bridge. Ah, oh, Christ! Christ, folks! It's, it landed on the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a disaster. Oh, my God. Uh, what does the CIA have to say about this? Uh, we have gotten some reports of rocket fire from Oakland. We're going to have to shut down the whole city of San Francisco until further notice. Ah, oh, shit! Damn! Well, back to, back to Oakland! That's the closest place we got. Oakland, take it away, Oakland. This just in, we're at the Oakland Cannabis Club, and that's why you see me with the hard hat on, because it's still a dangerous area right here. And it has been confirmed that a plane has gone down. A plane has gone down. Back to you, Spelly. New York City, what do you got to say, New York City? We have no idea if there's any survivors at all. It cartwheeled down the runway after hitting the bridge. It is pandemonium, folks. Slides were deployed, a couple people got out. It's, it's chaos, it's absolute chaos. Oh my God, Nebraska, tell me what's going on. Oh, that's that thing that flies. There's a lot of people on it. Wait, wait, Oakland, what do you got? Yes, this is Boots Lee Farnsworth from WEHI and we're at the Oakland Cannabis Club and I have it confirmed. Uh, one of my friend's friends, cousin, Pookie, said that the plane did go down. Pookie, to quote you, I seen the whole thing. It went down. 
Back to you, Smelly. What's Nebraska got to say about this tragic plane crash? Yes, North Korea, a plot to take down a South Korean airliner. Top C, okay, I won't say anything. Hey, turn that camera off. WEHI, take it away. Thank you. This is Bootsy Farnsworth from WEHI reporting from Oakland. That is true. The plane did go down. There are casualties. We think there might be, wait a minute, two, two casualties? Come on now. You saw that Pookie said it was a fireball. Are you trying to go against Pookie? I don't think so. But I know there's smoke. There is smoke. I know we're at a cannabis club. There's smoke and we're getting the munchies like a mug up in here. So hand me some Doritos and we'll be back to you, Spelly. Oh, I just wish we had somebody that was there on the site that could see what was going on. What do you mean, Sandra? Pierre? We're getting a, a, a video feed from Pierre right now? Let, let's take it away to Pierre right now. Oh, wee oui, wee, oui, hello, folks. It is I, Pierre Otta, here in San Francisco on vacation. And I was just uh, out here in the bay on the way to AT&T Park to see your Giants play the baseball. That's a game you guys play, I hear. I've never seen the baseball, but I like to see the baseball. I'm whacking the home run. Wee, wee, wee. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm swimming along. Do, 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 do. And guess what happened, folks? This plane is coming down, and oh, it just missed the runway. It missed it completely. I mean, whoa, dude. And it hit the ground and bounced, and then it landed, and the people got out. And then the thing caught on fire. Well, that's what happened, and that's it from here, Spilly. I'm on my way to the baseball game, and I will talk to you later. Pierre Otto signing out. Do we we? Oh, well, I guess that was it then. You know, the pilot just goofed, and he landed in the water and bounced around, and only a couple people died. And you know, we're from here at issues. We're sorry about that, but. Uh, Man, that reporting sure was exciting, wasn't it? I, I know I was sitting on the edge of my seat. But anyway, we'll find out what happens with that. I, I, I'm hearing right now uh, the investigation will go on for three and a half years or into the next recession, whichever comes first. Okay, well, back to the news, folks. Why does the world hate us? Oh, I don't know. You know, it's like you have people overseas are not real happy and the people in Africa aren't real happy. You know, they were protesting. The president just went there and they weren't happy. And so let, let, let me kind of go over my list here. Why does the world hate us? Well, maybe it's because we killed off all the Indians and said it was all part of uh, prosperity for the white people. Or maybe it's because we kill off all of our animals and everything's endangered and we got no natural species left. Or maybe it's just because we kill off all the humans. I mean, one by one, we're just killing off humans. I mean, who cares? And, oh, hell, we torture people. We don't let them go. We don't even have to charge them with anything. We could just say, hey, you're going to go into jail, and we're going to torture you for 10 years. You know, hey, you know, why would anybody hate us for that? I don't understand. And, oh, why, because we go around the world and cause civil wars and promote hatred? You think that's why the people hate us? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Need I go on? But, and there's, and there's much more important issues, folks. And, you know, there's ways we can fix that, but will we? No, because you can just see how our politics are working right now. The poor students, all you folks up at UCSC, guess what you get to look forward to this semester? Your interest rates have just doubled. That's right, you went from paying 3% to 6% overnight. And you know what, folks? It's coming down to this. All the politicians are saying, this is really bad. We, we can't let this happen. Uh, it's going to ruin our society. It's going to take jobs away from us in the future. But what did they do? Absolutely nothing. They couldn't even garner 60 votes out of all those people that are saying this is so important. They couldn't even make it happen. Now, I think it's going to be a war, folks. I have a feeling they're going to go in the ring. They're going to start duking it out. 
as, as Ed would say, you know, mama's going to knock you out. Well, you know what, mama, you better jump in that ring right now, baby, because if you want your kids to go to school, you're going to have to fight the banker. His name is Mr. Rothschild. That's right. They're the ones calling the shots over there in the London banks, and I guess there's all kinds of trouble with them, but we won't get into that on this show because this is about you college kids losing your education. But you know what the one good senator, Republican, I don't know where he's from, but he said, well, we need to re-educate people anyway into working for jobs, that they don't need that kind of education. We need to start getting back to trade schools and things like that. So you can work on cars and you can work on teeth and do things that are important to society as opposed to being a scholar or, or creating some new cancer cure or, or, or doing research that might save the planet down the road. That's not important. What we need is our automobiles running our, uh, and, and we need to have the bankers getting lots of interest. And now, even though the government is only paying, what, 0.34% interest? Hey, 6%. When, what is the government? Are they like uh, in the banking business now? I can't hear you. Well, I hope you're getting pissed, folks. But you know what it all comes down to? It's just politics is normal. And we got all kinds of great things coming up in the next few months, like the deficit limit is going to be hit here in a few months. And we got this kid's interest rate. And oh, what about that farm bill that never went through? You know, we got two years before the next presidential election. We got one year before the next Senate race. I have a feeling, mark my words here, July, we're July 10th, folks, 2013. I bet you right now ain't nothing going to happen between now and then. So anyway, I got a great show for you. We've got the Mumbles with Mo part two. That's right, Mo, our illustrious mannequin, is here tonight talking with Joe Sams and Spilly Chili about the great upcoming movie, Summertime Memories. Oh boy, let's take a look at that, shall we? Oh, thanks for having me here, Mo. It's a real pleasure. Oh, my movie, you say? Well, uh, mm. I just made a movie with uh, some public access icons, so along with many other people. It's a, a first-person perspective nightmare dream sequence movie. And I think you'll really like it, because from your haircut, you seem like you're into some weird stuff. My hair. I don't care. What was the hardest part? Well, you know there's a lot of really hard parts. Uh, we had struggles with the locations and some parts, which required us to sort of find ulterior ways to uh -huh. get the film shot. People dropped out of my film, so I had to take their place. Um, I built this guy right here. This is my firstborn child, Gert. He's, um, he's only a few months old, almost half a year old, I'd say. Uh -huh. He rules. and. Um, Oh, there's his hat, but he's mm -hmm. he's a very fragile young fellow. Cash. Oh, how did I pay for this? Well, you know, there's a couple of different methods. I uh, I started out with an Indiegogo campaign, and I'd never done one before, so I kind of fucked it up, and I got like 50 bucks. But I have uh, these very supportive parents who helped me pay for some of it. Also, I uh, just found a lot of the stuff on the streets, you know? I just kind of utilized all my resources, like Abbey carpets, for instance. I uh, mm -hmm. needed a carpet for, my crazy, for the crazy hallway that we built from scratch. So I went to uh, the Abbey carpet on Geary Street in San Francisco and told them about it, and the main guy who worked there was really cool and just gave me a carpet for free. So really, it's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. trying to find the right places, you know? 
Well, you know, that's a good question. I, I myself would say there's a couple of different stars of the film, one of which being Spilly Chili, of course. Um, Spilly Chili plays two different characters. Um, we have Emmett Vollers, who's this little kid. He's only three years old. He's never acted before, but he managed to do everything perfectly for my movie. We got Bobby Ackerley right here. He played a clown who eats a baby as well as a janitor, and uh, he knocked it out of the park for that. And uh, we also have a few other people like Russell, my friend Russell Coker. He has uh, pimples in the film. But also, we have Metal Mike from the Angry Samoans. Uh, the Angry Samoans are one of my favorite bands ever. And I, one of my friends, Heath Stone, he put on a Santa Cruz show with the Angry Samoans, and I was able to talk to him after the show. And I got him to agree to be in the movie, and uh, he was really awesome. He did a really good job. We put this Toxic Avenger style makeup on his face and had his, uh, had his head kind of breathe like this a little bit. It's hard to explain, but you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it. You'll like it. Interesting. For a movie. Influences. Oh, well, you know, I have, I have uh, quite a few different influences. A lot of it are movies from the 80s by very particular directors like David Lynch. I'd say, well, the 70s, too, because of Eraserhead. Eraserhead was in the 70s. That's a huge influence because of how visual it is. And also, uh, Terry Gilliam's work in the 80s as well as the 70s with all his Monty Python movies, especially The Meaning of Life in Brazil. And uh, David Cronenberg's earlier work, how he does his in-production special effects, as well as Lloyd Kaufman from Troma for his early works, as well as just his prolific filmography of just crazy special effects and uh, titties and gore. And uh, also music. Music really influenced me. The band Swans, Michael Jira Swans, really influenced me, as well as um, just all kinds of stuff. It's really endless mo, you know? <laughs> well, Mo, that's a really good question. You know, I, I wasn't uh, overly excited about the project at first, but then, you know, I saw Joe's enthusiasm about everything, and he showed up with his little sketch pads about, you know, all these little frames, and it was getting sillier and sillier, and I was like, yeah, you know, this just might work. You know, it's hard to say, but uh, when I got to see it, I was really tickled pink. It was a big blast to be on the big screen. It's something I never imagined doing. Uh, you know, the reaction of the audience at the premiere was just truly fabulous. We had a big, big crowd, and everybody just loved the movie. Especially when Gert was on the, the, on the, the screen, he, the whole crowd just reacted. It was just really marvelous. Gert, you're amazing. It was a real pleasure to work with you, by the way. You didn't provide any fusses or cause any stress. But anyway, I, I had a great time. But why don't we show a, a clip of the coffin building sequence then? Yeah, let's see some of the... Well, you know, I don't know if I ever do another movie again in my life, if I'm ever so fortunate. You know, it'd be great if I could, but, uh, you know, uh, what about you, Joe? Well, you know, actually, uh, my editor, Tom McGovern, and I are starting to develop this, um, this movie that has a lot of influences and a lot of characters that we want to bring into it, but we haven't really come up with the details. We know it's going to be about time travel, and it's going to be called Future Shock and it's going to be in high contrast black and white. What am I going for with this film? I would say I don't want people to fully understand it because it's supposed to be a nightmare. So I want you to have the feeling, I tried to represent a nightmare as visual as I possibly could, so I didn't want any dialogue. I wanted it to be very visual and I didn't want it to necessarily make sense even though I have a very coherent plot from beginning to end in my head that I can explain to anybody who I'm seeing the movie with. But I like it that way because 
I get different interpretations from everybody who sees it. I get people saying one thing that I never even thought of that has a connection to this other thing. And I wanted it to be very open to interpretation. So. Remember, remember, remember Elvis. Elvis was the most random character in the film, but he actually comes from a real part of reality in my childhood, which is uh, another big influence of this movie was this convalescent home I used to go to with my grandma, or that's where she lived for the last moments of her life. But I would go there with my friends, and we'd actually walk around the, the convalescent home and just look at, through the doors and see what kind of people were there because they were all really interesting. And, uh, this one guy would play for everybody, he'd perform, and he would dress up like Elvis, but he was clearly not Elvis. He was this guy with these huge, crazy mutton chops, and he didn't sound anything like Elvis. I don't even think he played Elvis. Songs. I think we all knew an Elvis impersonator at one point yeah. or another. <laughs> I'm definitely going to submit it to Troma Dance. I actually heard I have a, uh, a mutual friend with Lloyd Kaufman. Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm really glad I could make it on your show. And um, if you had a hand, I would shake it. But I'll shake Gert's hand instead, because he can't shake your hand either. Well, folks, that brings us to a close of another exciting episode of Issues. And I sure hope you enjoyed this. That was some pretty good stuff, huh? How about those reporters? Got to thank all those guys for reporting on that plane crash. And thanks to Joe and all the people of Summertime Memories. I'm hoping that movie's going to be in the Santa Cruz Film Festival. Hope you come down there and see that. And Spewy the Clown says, All right, that's it, folks. Good night. <laughs>